Okay. So today it's a great pleasure to have Christophe Garbon from the University of Lyon, who is going to, to let us know about continuous symmetry breaking along the Nishimori line. So before we start, let me ask everybody to, to mute yourself during the talk, but questions are most welcome. So please unmute yourself and ask questions directly. Also, you can ask questions uh, with a chat, in which case I would read it to, to Christophe. So Christophe. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you very much for the for this uh, great invitation. Um, I will tell you about um, a joint work with uh, Tom Spencer, and uh, I, I think without the COVID and the lockdown, uh, it's unlikely that uh, this work would exist. It was thanks to discussions uh, during the first lockdown, and uh, the the goal will be to tell you about. Um, uh, a, a, a technique which uh, provides continuous symmetry breaking in ZD, um, but which does not rely at all on uh, reflection positivity. And um, the second part of the title is uh, about the Nishimura line that I will uh, introduce uh, later on. And so we will prove a continuous symmetry breaking uh, in the presence of a quench disorder and the quench disorder will have to get a specific law so that the proof will work. And I think the interesting part of the interesting aspect of the talk is that uh, first, we do not need reflection positivity. And the second, there will be a link with a Bayesian statistics. Uh, and I will spend some time during the talk to solve a Bayesian statistics uh, problem for you. Uh, and it has been solved by uh, Emmanuel Abbe and uh, uh, and his co-authors, I will give the names uh, later. Okay, so um, let me start with a, a few uh, classical spin systems. Uh, I will mention that from time to time the quantum spin systems because my feeling is that in this audience, um, they are even more appealing to you. So I will mention this, but most of the talk will be on the classical, all, all of the talk will be on the classical spin systems. So in this setting, we, we have a, a grid, we have a graph, which will be ZD. And uh, on, this, uh, on, this, uh, on each uh, vertex of this grid, we assign a spin, um, which uh, may live in different spaces. I will give these four examples here. Um, the most classical one maybe is the easing model where the spins are plus or minus one valued. And in this case, the Gibbs measure uh, is written like that, where beta is the inverse temperature one over T. And when beta is very large, the system uh, wants the spins to be basically uh, aligned in the same direction. Um, the second line is the case of the XY model or also plane rotator model. Now each uh, vertex X in ZD carries a spin uh, uh, which lives in the, in the in the sphere uh, S1, or, or is represented by E to the I theta X. And in this case, it's known that uh, there is long range order in dimension D greater or equal to three. Um, and in that case, there are a, a rather large variety of proofs. You can use reflection positivity, but uh, you may also use the fact that, uh, that the symmetry is abelian and uh, there is a kind of a Fourier transform of this system, which allows you to have a, a different proof, uh, which was done by Froelich and Spencer uh, also on the beginning of the 80s. And the last two lines, so in dimension two, maybe before I go to the others, uh, it's known uh, in much more generality than just for the XY model that there is no long range order, but for this specific model, it's known that there is quasi long range order and this is a deep uh, and well-known theorem by Froelich and Spencer in uh, 1981. So now uh, the last two examples uh, are examples where the undialing symmetry is uh, non-abelian. And uh, for example, the classical Eisenberg model uh, consists in assigning to each vertex X a spin in the unit sphere S2. Again, the, the, the Gibbs measure is the, the same as before. And now we sum over the neighboring sites, the scalar product at I times, uh, times the vector at uh, J. And um, in this case, the, the two dimensional uh, model is uh, extremely interesting. It's uh, conjectured since Polyakov that there is exponential decay of correlation, whatever beta is, but it's not known. 
Um, and in dimension D greater or equal to three, I will have a slide uh, just after this one. Um, in some sense, the only tool known to address uh, this model is reflection positivity. And there is also a work, uh, a series of work by Balaban, which uh, allows you to, to, to analyze such uh, non-abelian symmetry. And the last example I want to give is a uh, very similar in nature to the classical Heisenberg model, but this time, each uh, point on the lattice will carry a group element UX, which will leave, for example, in SU2, and later on, it will be any uh, matrix Lie group that you can uh, think of. And now when you have uh, this, the, the, the natural Gibbs measure that you assign is still a sum over neighboring sites in the lattice. And you want the spins to sort of align uh, in the same direction. And the, the right interaction you can play with is, the, is to take the trace of uh, UI star UJ and, uh, and then a real part if, uh, if you have a complex valued early group. Okay, so in the next, uh, in the next slide, I just have two pictures to, to, to just to warm up. So this is a two dimensional easing model close to the critical temperature. So there is not yet long range order, but almost uh, the, the plus phase is uh, rather robust here, but the, the minus phase is uh, quite robust here. Um, and uh, all the proofs or the methodologies that you, that you could use in, in this easing setting heavily rely on the plus minus uh, discrete symmetry. For example, the Payles argument uh, relies heavily on the fact that there is a, uh, you, you need a lot of energy to, to switch from plus to minus. The picture on the right is a simulation of the plane rotator model in dimension two, and is supposed to illustrate in, in, in some sense the, the quasi long range order that you see in the BKT uh, phase transition. Okay, so this slide is, uh, is still about the, the, the last two models that I started with. And, uh, and it's just here to emphasize that reflection positivity is something uh, which is uh, very powerful, which has been designed by Frölich Simon Spencer in 1976. Um, and it's also something which, uh, which is um, uh, somewhat rigid. For example, the choice of the graph uh, needs to be so that, uh, that you can play with many symmetries in order to apply the reflection positivity. And uh, if you were to prove a long range order in a finite but large box of Z3, for example, you would be in trouble. You would not be able to use uh, this tool here. If you had at your disposal Ginebra correlation inequalities, maybe this would work, but they are not known. Uh, and maybe even they are wrong, uh, that I'm not quite sure in the case of the classical Heisenberg model. So let me just mention that uh, um, in the case of this Pino and model, Lis and Taggy have proved some kind of monotony CD properties that are interesting in this case. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, a second slide about reflection positivity, which is maybe uh, what this audience would be the most interested uh, in, but, but you already all know about this, is the, the case of, um, of quantum uh, spin systems. So here I, I, I very shortly defined the, the spin wall uh, one half Heisenberg anti ferromagnet, ferromagnet, sorry. So um, the only thing I want to emphasize is that uh, since uh, 1978, by uh, using the same reflection positivity, it is known in this quantum case that there is a long range order in dimension, in dimension D equals three and higher. But uh, since then, uh, as far as I know, it's uh, completely open to prove the same statement in the case of the ferromagnet uh, Heisenberg uh, quantum model. And, uh, and, uh, and so uh, when I gave the talk I'm about to give in, uh, in ICMP uh, in August, uh, many people asked me whether uh, the tool we use with uh, Tom Spencer could it be used in the case of a quantum spin system? And uh, the answer is, I don't know, but uh, if you have any clue at the end of this talk to transfer those ideas to the quantum setting, uh, I'd be happy to discuss it with you. 
Okay, so now I will enter uh, really into the type of uh, quench disorders that, uh, that we're interested in. Um, I forgot to say, but uh, please interrupt uh, anytime you wish. I'm happy if, if it is, uh, if I'm not alone in front of my screen. So the first model uh, I want to, 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 to tell you about is, uh, is the case of the easing model, but I will add to it a bit of quench disorder. And a, a reasonable way to have a quench disorder, you have several ways. Either you had quench disorder in the magnetic sense, you had a, a random field uh, as in the works of Eisenman and Ver, for example, and there were many recent works, including a very interesting one this morning by, uh, by, um, by Zhang Ding and, and Zhuang. Um, but in this slide and in the rest of the slides, the disorder will rather live on the, on the edges. And in the case of the random bond easing model, what you do is independently on each edge of your graph, so this is Z2, but think of ZD, um, assigned a, a disorder JIJ, uh, which will be plus one with quality P and minus one with quality one minus P. So for example, if P is equal to one in this graph, which I borrowed from Nishimori in his paper in 1981, I think, when P is equal to one, uh, what you have here is exactly the Gibbs measure of the classical easing model. There is no, no disorder. And when P drops to smaller values, uh, which is illustrated here, uh, you create more and more frustrations, a little bit like, uh, like in the spin glass. And uh, the Gibbs measure, the quench Gibbs measure is more and more uh, disordered, sort of to speak. And uh, for this model, so what is known is that uh, and this was a, a, a very uh, beautiful observation of Nishimori that I, that I will keep discussing about later in this talk. There is a specific line uh, in this uh, two parameter space. So there is the temperature here, and there is this uh, P value for the disorder on the bones. And in this diagram, there is this specific line on which you, it, it happens that you can compute many things explicitly. And we will see an instance of this later in this talk. And thanks to this, uh, to this uh, integrable setting in some sense, Nishimori managed to prove that uh, here on this line, uh, close to, uh, to small temperatures, there is ferromagnetic order, there is long range order. And uh, so in some sense it's here, so imagine P is very uh, close to one, there are few frustrations and the temperature is very low it looks rather intuitive that if you start with plus boundary conditions here, far away, the plus boundary condition will leave, will, will, will remain, will keep uh, being aligned all the way to the bulk of the system. And in fact, thanks to the discrete symmetry uh, around at the same time, Origoshi and Morita, they prove that there is ferromagnetic uh, long range order for this open set of, uh, of parameters for any P close to one and any temperature T close to zero. Okay, so in the next slide, I will do the same thing, the same type of quench disorder, but in the case of the XY model. So, so now uh, I will still have a quench disorder, which, which will be ID and will live on the edges. So the disorder on one edge will be independent of the disorder on a different edge. And it will have the same philosophy that uh, when uh, P will be close to one, it will be uh, very much like the classical XY model. And when P will be smaller and smaller, it will be uh, more and more disordered with more and more uh, frustrations. So instead of P, I will use the parameter U and the, the relationship between P and U will be a little bit like in FK percolation. And now we'll leave the, the P parameter and only talk about U. And um, my disorder will have the following law for each U. So I fix an edge, I and J, for example, this edge here. And I want to pick a, a random variable omega ij on this edge, whose law will be given uh, by this probability measure on minus pi pi. And the only thing which is important for you to visualize is that if u is very, very small, let's even say u equals zero, 
then the law on the disorder is, 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 is very big. You have a uniform random variable on minus pi pi. If u starts to be very large, which boils down to having p here very close to one, then uh, your distribution is more and more uh, concentrated among zero, uh, which will correspond in my quenched Gibbs measure to have basically a classical XY model. Okay, so U small, very disordered, U large, uh, omega IJ are basically, uh, basically zero. And now the quenched probability measure given a family of omega IJ is the same as the XY model, exactly like before except uh, I had this, uh, this omega ij in my cosine theta i minus theta j plus this. So I perturb a little bit the way I measure theta i minus theta j, I add something along the bond ij. Okay, so what is known here? It's known by reflection positivity, but also uh, using specific tools that uh, that rely on the, on the abelian symmetry of this system. It is known that when D is greater or equal to three, so say on Z3, it's known that this system, the classical XY model uh, has long range order. And this corresponds to U equals infinity or P equals one and, and for the temperature to be very small or beta to be very large. And uh, in this talk, we will be able to extend this result to uh, uh, a part of the Nishimori line here uh, I did not yet define the Nishimori line, but we will see that it will correspond to, to, to choosing for the disorder, uh, something where U is exactly equal to the inverse temperature beta. So the Nishimori lines in this setting is exactly when you take a inverse temperature beta, you need to put on your disorder, a distribution, which is E to the beta cosine here divided by that. And in some sense, this choice of a Nishimori line will be there to sort of cancel out the partition function. And when you hear that, you may, you may believe that everything which will follow will only be for annealed measure, but the strengths of those techniques will be that it will still be for the quenched uh, measure. Okay, so my last slide about definition is the next slide about the, the case of non-abelian symmetry. And here we'll do more or less the same thing. So now on each uh, side of the lattice, we will assign a, a, a Lie group matrix, which may live either in SO3, SU2, pick whichever group you, you prefer. And as before, the quench disorder will, will, will live on edges. It will be an ID field of uh, Lie group matrices omega IJ exactly as in the random bond easing model and exactly as in the random bond, random bond sorry, XY model. And, and now the, the law of the disorder on each edge will still be parameterized by this parameter U. U small, big disorder, U large, basically no disorder. And now the, the law that we will be interested in will be this one the probability to pick a matrix omega ij on the edge ij will be proportional to exponential u times uh, the trace of omega ij. And if I have a complex value that I need to add the real part, but I will not always do. So, so if u is extremely large, I want to pick the highest trace I can. And on my Lie group, basically I will have to pick the identity matrix. So when u is really large, this is what I wanted to represent here. Most of my disorder will be aligned along the identity element of my Lie group. And this will mean more or less no disorder in my quenched Gibbs measure. So here is the quenched Gibbs measure. It's written here. Given a disorder little omega, little omega will now uh, de denote the collection of all those matrices indexed by the edges. I want to sample uh, um, matrix elements at each vertex i in ZD according to this, uh, to this interaction. I sum over the neighboring edges, the real part of the trace, U star UJ as before, but I insert this disorder. And if U is very large, I keep saying that omega IJ is more or less exactly the identity plus something very small. 
So U very large, we recover the non-abelian uh, model that I had before. Another uh, important remark here, for any quenched disorder, any given quenched disorder omega, this quenched Gibbs measure as a G is G invariant. So I can, I can act on my spin uh, by G, by G, sorry, in such a way that the Hamiltonian will be preserved. And so I have a G non-abelian symmetry. Otherwise I cannot speak of continuous symmetry breaking. And, and when I do that, I, I need to be a little bit careful. If I act on the left, it will not be the case, but if I act on the right, it will indeed be G invariant. And uh, okay, so in this non-abelian setting, we have again the same uh, kind of Nishimori picture as the one we had for the random bond easing model. When D is greater or equal to three and U is infinite, so omega ij is identically equal to the identity of the, the Lie group G, we, we know that there is reflection positivity thanks to this uh, work I mentioned from 1976. And now the, the, the goal of this talk will be to say that along this line, at least for some time here, there will also be long range order, except the tool will be completely different from reflection positivity. Are there any questions so far on, on, on the definition of the models before I go to the result? So you still work on the regular G, that is CD. Uh, yes, yes, good question. Uh, so I still work so far in this definition on the ZD, but uh, I, I, I will mention uh, maybe in the next theorem that, uh, that uh, the proof will not be rigid at all. I could have holes in my lattice. I could have uh, long range uh, edges, uh, more or less anything I want so that the, the, the Bayesian statistical reconstruction I will introduce later will still work. Oh, so thank you. The proof will be very relaxed on how the lattice looks. In some sense, uh, the, uh, in, I will have a remark at the end saying that uh, the, the proof still work in a, in a two plus epsilon dimensional lattice, for example which would be hard to achieve with reflection positivity. So you will be defining the two plus one, two plus epsilon dimensional lattice. I'm not sure what how it looks like. Uh, it will only be one line, but uh, what I mean by that is uh, you can take, uh, you can take Z2. So let me do the, the one plus epsilon uh, with my video here. So I, I would take Z. And then I would take all the points uh, with a y coordinate would be below uh, y to the power uh, epsilon. So it's a kind of a cone uh, shape like that. And I can do a two plus epsilon uh, with the same ID. And, uh, and uh, I, will, I will explain to you at the last remark in the talk why we have long range order for this Nishimori line in two plus epsilon dimension. Thanks, but it would work with reflection positivity as well. I'm not sure because uh, because the graph I'm talking about uh, doesn't have any symmetry. Uh, it's very asymmetric. Ah, so, so I, I probably misunderstood the, the shape um, of the... Of may, the maybe I can try to make a picture. One second. So I'm not sure this will be visible, but I think something like that. I, I see. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Uh, yes, I have one, Christophe. Hi, Alessandro. Hi. Um, so you this uh, so you mentioned that the, on this Nishimori line. Uh, um, the, the, these models uh, are known to be solvable in some in some way. So, what does it? So, what was uh, already computed? So, apparently, it was not known that uh, you, are, you had some kind of long range order. So, you you have what the formula of the free energy or, or, or what? Yes, exactly. So, what was known? So, 
So I think Nishimori has uh, analyzed the case of the of the easing model with this precise uh, disorder. Then uh, uh, I will not have all the names, but uh, I think uh, Pierre Ledoussal has done some works with uh, with uh, POTS models. Uh, Nishimori later on did some works with the XY model. I'm not sure anyone has looked at non-abelian models, but but it would have the same flavor. Um, the specificity of this disorder allows you to compute uh, not quite the free energy, but uh, things that look very much like the, the specific heat. And uh, to be precise, uh, it allows you to to compute a sort of partial derivative in this direction, not quite in this direction. It's not exactly a specific heat where beta and the disorder go in this direction, but it's kind of partial derivative like that. And, do you, and do you get critical exponents uh, at the transition line, uh, at the transition point? Uh, mm, that I'm not sure, so it's a very interesting question. So there is indeed, a, critical point here with a certain universality class, I suppose. And uh, Tom uh, kept telling me that it, it must be very interesting and, uh, and indeed, but I have, I have nothing interesting to say uh, on this uh, critical point here. Okay, thanks. Other questions? So if not, uh, let me uh, let me state the, the theorem. So, so so before we go to the theorem, more or less everything is in this uh, picture. So 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 when there is no disorder, uh, there is reflection positivity, and the or theorem is that there is a long range order uh, along this line for a certain y. And of course, our technique do not allow us to go anywhere close to the critical point. And what is the technique we use? It's called the group synchronization. And in fact, our work heavily relies on a, a work which appeared in, in Bayesian statistics. It's in Bayesian statistics, but uh, I guess Montanari, uh, you know that he knows a great deal of statistical physics. Uh, Emmanuel Abbe also, uh, Alan Sly uh, in Princeton uh, a lot. I mean, maybe all of them. So it's in, it's in Bayesian statistics, but they have, uh, of course, a, a great knowledge of statistical physics. And uh, I will tell you what was their motivation and what was their results. And uh, in their work, they already anticipated that uh, it should give a long range order for such uh, uh, disordered spin system. I think they even stated it as a corollary. And, uh, and, uh, and, and while well, corollary, I think uh, we'll, you'll see that there is a second big input to make a proof, but, but in any case, their work is, a, is, a, is a, the big input of this technique. And so the, 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 the result we can show is that if you take any uh, Lie group, uh, U1, SU2, SU3, uh, whatever, and if the dimension D is greater or equal to three, but I will have this comment that it also work in dimension two plus epsilon. Then if, uh, if the, the temperature is sufficiently low, if beta is sufficiently large, um, the expected value on the disorder of the quenched two point function here is bigger than this, uh, this, uh, this number here, uniformly in the distance between X and Y. It's uniform in the distance X and Y, and it's also in some sense uniform in the choice of the graph. You can have holes, you can have a, a boundary, which is a bit like the one I have drawn. Of course, if you start putting uh, many, many holes, it's going to start being wrong. So you have to be a bit careful in how many holes you put and how close the points X and Y are to these holes, things like that. But for example, you may even take X here just on the boundary, this would still work, but you cannot take X in a fjord or something like that. So the proof is very relaxed in how you design your graph and how, where your points are and, and everything. Okay, so I, will, I, will, I hope I will be able to tell you almost all the details of the proof. Of course, we have no, no idea how to extend the proof away from the Nishimori line. And it would be very interesting 
to be able, at least in a small open set here, to, to, to close the, the gap and to, 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 to get a different proof of long range order without reflection positivity, which would use the fact that when beta is very large, the Nishimori line is in, in, in some explicit way very close to the no, no disorder case. But, but we don't have such a proof uh, so far. So let me uh, tell you about the, the structure of the proof. So there are two main ingredients. One is this CRM from Bayesian statistics that I mentioned. And the second ingredient uh, uses the specificity of the Nishimori line. And this specificity uh, allows you to compute certain thermodynamic quantities that I mentioned to, uh, to the question of Alessandro before. And in particular, uh, the one we will use and we will prove is the following. So this is a lemma which was, uh, which is implicit in the work of Nishimori in the case of easing. Um, so it's not a surprising lemma from that point of view, but, it's but we state it in the following way. So on the Nishimori line, if you consider uh, the, uh, the, the local increments, u i star times the disorder times u j, so the, the increments, in, but, but uh, taking into account the, the quench disorder, this, uh, this family of random variables that are indexed by the edges, they happen to be independent of each other when we uh, look at the average quench measure. So we average with respect to the disorder, and then we have the Gibbs measure, here, which is not, I insist, the annealed measure. Okay, so being on this line will allow us to rely on this very important independence property. And uh, together with a, a, a nice problem in itself about the Bayesian reconstruction, we will prove the long range order. So now you can almost for a while forget everything I explained so far. And, um, and I want to, to tell you about uh, Bayesian statistics problem. So, so you have a grid, so Im imagine you have Z3, and on each uh, side of Z3, each vertex of Z3, you have a, a point in uh, SO3, let's say. So imagine you have a, a camera at each point X, G of X, a camera which is pointing in some direction, and the, 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 the camera next to you is pointing in a different direction, and all these cameras are, are, are filming maybe a, a, a Olympic Games course or something. And the, the reconstruction problem is as follows. You have access to the following information. For each uh, uh, nearest neighbor edge, you're given the, the increment between the two cameras, the ji minus one, jj, G, J, sorry, the j and the g. I'll do my best. So, so, so on, on each edge of Z, ZD, you have pointing cameras like that, and you know uh, what is the relative angle between the two cameras. And we, I'm speaking about Bayesian statistics. So if you had this big data, you would know everything. Uh, the point is that the data will be corrupted on each edge. Uh, the, this, this increment from G, GI to GJ uh, will have a little bit of noise. And the question they, 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 they want to ask is, given this uh, corrupted data, uh, so you know all the increments, but with a little bit of noise, are you able to recover uh, the, 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 the orientation between the camera at X and the camera at a very far point Y? So are you able to recover the relative positions of far distant cameras given this corrupted data. And, uh, and the striking answer by, uh, by uh, Abe, Masoulier, Montanari, Sly, and uh, Srivastava a few years ago is that in dimension two, uh, even if the noise is tiny, uh, there is nothing to do. You will be no it will be impossible when the point will get far from its order to recover the relative position which has a flavor of a Mermin-Wagner theorem. 
but they prove that in dimension d greater or equal to three, yes, you can recover at a relative position up to a small error. Of course, you have a small error, but this small error is uh, it doesn't blow up as x and y go to infinity. And uh, I hope I will be able to prove this uh, statistical reconstruction problem for you. Uh, I will give you the proof that they give in their paper. So to start with, uh, let's imagine that uh, you have no noise in your, uh, in your theory. And let's just uh, ask how to recover gx minus one, gy, how to recover the, the, the relative angle between two distant points without presence of any noise. So here it's easy to answer, pick any path gamma from X to Y and multiply all the relative angles along your path. And, uh, and this will uh, by definition give you uh, GX uh, minus one times GY. So uh, Bayesian statistics without noise is often easy. And this is, a, this is an example. So, so now, uh, now let's add independent noise on each of these edges. So we need to model what I mean by plus noise. So what I will do is I will take on each edge I neighboring J, I will take the relative position of these two cameras and I will multiply this by a, by a, by a ID matrix, omega IJ, exactly like before, um, whose law would be given by the, the, the laws I had before. When U is very large, I almost had no noise to the system. And when u is small, I basically reshuffle everything and I have no information. And this omega ij, I can act on the right, but I could also, if one, if one prefers, uh, add the noise between gi minus one and jj, both are possible. Okay, so given this corrupted data, where on each edge I multiply by a matrix which reshuffles things a little bit, I want to recover this. So I will do it in several steps. Uh, so I will do it in three attempts. The third attempt will work. The first two will not work. So first attempt, and I'm using uh, notations from statistics. So this at is there to, 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 to represent that I'm doing a, an estimation of what I want to recover. So I'm given on each edge ij, I'm given a, a random variable y ij, which is supposed to be what I'm looking for, but times the omega ij, which noise it a little bit. A first natural estimator for the jx minus one gy is to take the path gamma that I picked before and to multiply along that path all the data that I collected that I'm given. So I, I multiply all this y ik, ik plus one, where ik is here and ik plus one is, is here. So, so this, this will give me a terrible uh, uh, statistical estimator. Uh, first, uh, for the following reason, if I take the expectation of this, where I, I do the expectation with respect to the noise, where the noise is an ID field, ID uh, uh, G valued field on all the edges. If I take the expectation of this, I'm going to take the expectation of the product along the edges of gamma of these increments. Uh, since the field is ID, it's a product of these expectations here. And now in the next slide, I will compute what is the average on the disorder at one edge of such a matrix. So let's recall that the, the law of the disorder that I'm using is given by this, this uh, exponential U times the trace of omega IJ. So, so this is something that is a, a sort of a, uh, that is a, when U is large, it's a very uh, concentrated around the identity. And there, there are lots of symmetries here. It's invariant by, if I had SO3, it would be invariant by SO2 uh, acting on the two other variables. And from this invariant, it's easy to see that the expectation of this random matrix is proportional to the identity of the Lie group G. It's proportional and there is a, a lambda and this lambda will play a key role in uh, everything which will follow where lambda is between zero and one. So just to fix things, if U is enormous, if U is very, very large, 
this, uh, this polity measure on the Lie group is more or less a Dirac point mass at the identity. And in, in that case, lambda of u will be basically equal to one. While if u is very small, I almost have the R measure. And if I take the expectation of a point in the R measure, I have zero. Okay, so lambda will vary from zero to one. Lambda very small, big disorder. Lambda very close to one, uh, little disorder. So each of these uh, expectations gives me a lambda times identity of the group. So the expectation of my estimator uh, is lambda to the number of edges that I need to go from X to Y times what I wanted to recover. This I don't know, this is my target, but my estimator is, is completely tiny with respect to my goal because of this lambda to the length of gamma. So the first attempt, does not even succeed in the sense of the first moment. So this is usually not so good in statistics. So second attempt, which is almost the same, um, how to repair uh, the fact the first moment didn't match, I just multiply by this one over lambda to the gamma. So now at least, it's a minor thing, but at least the first moment matches with what we want to reconstruct. So maybe it looks innocent, but I want to uh, emphasize one thing. Before my estimator was still living in the Lie group G. Now that I do this, uh, I really use the fact that uh, I view these things in the spaces of the matrices. I, I leave the Lie group and I want to use linear algebra. Finish. So this is no longer an element of my Lie group. But this is still a very bad uh, statistical estimator. Why? Because I fixed gamma, so along gamma, I will accumulate a lot of disorder, a lot of errors, and by the time I will reach y, basically uh, we will have something which will be uh, uniformly distributed on G, even though I just said that this is no longer in G. But this, the orientation will be completely lost because of all this disorder that we accumulate along the past gamma. So let's quantify this. A way to see that things are terrible is to, is to compute the second moment. So I want to compute the second moment of this uh, statistical estimator, and I need to do this for a certain uh, norm on, the, on, on these matrices. And the natural norm here is this uh, Frobenius norm, square root of the trace of M, M star. And if I compute this uh, L2 moment uh, squared, uh, I will have a one over lambda to the two times the length of gamma. And here I denoted the, the product along gamma here. And uh, here, I don't know if it's visible, there is the same thing, but star. So if I take this and, and use that A B star is B star A star, I will start seeing a lot of cancellation. The last term will come here and G I N, G I N star will cancel. These two will cancel. Sorry, this is my mouse, it's not great. They will cancel and so on and so forth. And I will only have identity here. And that means my second moment will be exactly given by this huge uh, scalar here. So I have a centered estimator. It's centered around what I want to recover, but the variance is enormous. So no way I can recover any meaningful information. So the last attempt is there to try to reduce as much as possible the variance of this estimator. And the idea is, is, is rather natural. One pass was not so good. So let's try to average over as many passes as possible the estimator we had before. And the right way to, to make sense of this is to pick mu, a probability measure on directed paths that travel from X to Y. As a side comment, if you happen to have a hole here in your graph, you would need to pick your measure mu so that your directed paths avoid this, uh, this, uh, this hole that you have here. So pick a priority measure mu, and now the, the estimator will be the same as before. So this is still to make sure that uh, the expectation is uh, on the target. But now I average the estimator with respect to many possible choices of paths from X to Y. So this is the same as before. I'm using the linearity here. And, and this gives me 
a well-defined estimator, which is measurable with respect to the co-opted data that I'm given in this problem. So we by still, linearity, I still have this. Yeah. Is the length of the path fixed? Mm. Oh yes, good question. So, so yes, there, there, is, there is no reason to do that. I could put this parameter here and yes. put a priority uh -huh. measure with different lengths, but but we don't we don't need to 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 average mm -hmm. also on the length of the path. We can mm -hmm. stick to. But okay. but this is indeed a, a good question. One may imagine that maybe we 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 would even reduce the variance by also averaging on different lengths. So so this is still centered here. This is good. But now let me try to do the the the, the computation of the second moment and I, I see that I'm uh, much uh, slower uh, than I expected so I will do it a bit too quickly but just to give you the flavor when we now do the the second moment as usual with second moment we will average with, with respect to mu tensor or mu so we will pick two pass gamma and gamma prime uh, independently of each other according to this measure mu on, on directed pass and we have to understand the cross correlation of the product of these increments along gamma times the product of the increments along gamma prime. And now uh, the, the star here is very nice because again, I have some constellations, but I will have a constellation of this and this only if gamma and gamma star ends at the same edge. Otherwise, if they don't, well, I don't have the same metric. They're independent of each other. And if they do not cross each other, they do not intersect, I cannot cancel them out. And I will have a lambda factor for this one, a lambda factor for this one, which will cancel out those ones here. So I may go uh, too, too fast here, but I claim that I have for each uh, increment, a lambda squared if uh, the, the edges are different and I have one otherwise which all together gives me this nice formula for the second moment. I claim that the second moment of my estimator is ex expectation around a pass sampled according to gamma, an independent pass gamma prime, and I need to, to see by how much they, they intersect together. So for example, here, they intersect one, two, and three times. There are three common edges, and I would have one over lambda squared to the power three. So now the game is to try to design a priority measure, which is such that it minimizes the overlaps of two independent paths. And, and now comes the interesting thing uh, that I didn't know before we worked with the term on this. Of course, you would want to take the most natural one seems to be to, to take the uniform measure on paths that travel in a directed way from X to Y. Say the, in my picture, the east-south oriented paths. If you take the uniform measure on this path, there are finitely many such paths, this Laplace transform here will blow up as X and Y will go to infinity in dimension three. So you may think, okay, this technique there is no way it works, but still you're happy because in dimension four, a uniform measure on this directed pass will give a finite Laplace transform uniformly in the distance between X and Y. Now, the beautiful thing is that in fact, in dimension three, you can design a, a pretty measure mu, which is very far from the, from the uniform measure on pass. And it has been built by Benjamin Pimentel and Perez for different motivations in 1998, and in dimension three, they can produce a measure which avoids itself very efficiently and which uh, reduces the cross intersections like that sufficiently well to have a finite Laplace transform. And this is the key. This theorem by Benjamin Pimentel and Perez is a key tool somehow in this story if you want to do long range order in dimension three. So the ingredient two, I, I wanted to, to do it, but I will not. This is this is the special uh, feature of Nishimori. Maybe let me just go. Um, it is okay if you take five more minutes. So don't go too fast. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank. I can come back if there is a. 
question, but I, I just want to give you a very quick flavor here. When I, when I, when I, okay, so maybe just in one minute, uh, I want to say that the increments on this edge will be independent for this increment on this edge for the average quench measure. How do I spot such an independence? For each edge, I will choose a certain observable on that edge, observable of the system, which would be a certain function uh, from the Lie group G to R, let's say, or to the, to the complex field, if you wish. And I want to, 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 to spot this factorization property when I do the average quenched measure. And it will be very important in the slide after that the parameter of the disorder U has to be equal to beta. Otherwise, I will not have this exact independence and the proof, if any, will be harder. Now, uh, let us write down what is this expectation here. This, uh, this uh, uh, average quenched measure. So I, I'm averaging with respect to the disorder, which is an ID disorder on all the edges of this, uh, of this quenched Gibbs measure on, the, uh, on, on my statistical physics problem, which now puts spins UI in the group G at each I. So let me not go too much into the details, but the, 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 the key idea, so maybe without going into details, if you remember the statistical physics, the, the, the Bayesian reconstruction problem, there is a feeling of gauge transformation. Why? Because before you start putting uh, a noise, if I take a pass gamma or another pass gamma prime, they will give the same result gx minus one gy. It doesn't depend on the pass I'm using. When I start putting noise on the edges, uh, it's as if uh, I don't have quite a zero form anymore, but I really have a one form, which is not an exact one form. And so uh, probably uh, uh, quotienting out things that uh, arise from the zero forms is a good idea. And this is exactly what Nishimori did, is using this uh, gauge transformation. So, so, so it's a certain transformation, a certain change of variables, both on the spins and on the disorder. So this is important to act on the two things simultaneously, which is such that the numerator is preserved. The Hamiltonian is preserved under this gauge transformation. The partition function is preserved. So you may, you may feel, okay, so what did we do? We didn't change neither this nor that, but there is a, subtle effect, which is that we may change uh, what happens in the law of the disorder because it's a change of variable. So if we look at what is the average with respect to the disorder, this gauge transformation has the following effect here. It's changing uh, the way you put a weight on your disorder. And the, the miracle of the Nishimori line is quite simple, is the fact that um, this is not affected by the change of variable, only this is affected. But then you can average with respect to the gauge transformation that you do. And when you average, this kills the law of the disorder here with respect to the denominator here. And this canceling out of the partition function and the disorder, which is not the same as doing an annealed average, uh, is responsible for the special feature of the Nishimori line. And in, in, in one word, um, when you mix ingredient one and ingredient two, it works as follows. The goal is to understand the two points correlation function here under the average uh, Gibbs measure, average quench measure. So this is very hard to compute. Uh, um, I mean, uh, reflection positivity would certainly not work because of the disorder, which makes it completely asymmetric. But here, what we can do is we can compute instead the same quantity, but where we make this insertion here of a, the reconstruction operator that we had before. And when we make this insertion, uh, we can use this big independence on, the, on, all the, on all the edges. So this goes too fast, but by inserting this operator, we have a, a big factorization of this quantity. And it's easy to see that this expectation here is basically one or, or rather trace of the identity matrix. So when you insert that using uh, Benjamini Pimentel-Perez and using 
um, this observation, this reconstruction of AB et al, this gives exactly one. And you conclude by saying that what you want, this two point correlation function, is this easy sort of to speak uh, quantity, which is exactly just this deterministic thing, plus an error. So this could be very troublesome. But the reconstruction algorithm tells you that in L2, this is very small. And so you don't lose much. And I, I think I should stop just if you don't have ideas of question, I, I can tell you. So, so everything I said uh, so far works very well when you have um, statistical physics model on a, on, a, on, a, on a Lie group valued points. We use a lot the, group, the underlying group structure. In the case of the classical Eisenberg model, you can still do a Nishimori line. But in that case, uh, you do not anymore uh, break continuous symmetry. Um, the disorder is less uh, symmetric, so to speak, except, and maybe this is uh, interesting in, in its own, I don't know, in the case of the classical O4 model, in which case uh, uh, we have a symmetry breaking of isoclinic, isoclinic rotations, so only half of uh, SO4 in, in a certain set. So, I can uh, give you more comments if you wish. And uh, I wanted to tell you that we can extend this to a uh, abelian lattice gauge theory with a, with a quench disorder that lives on the, on the plaquette. Um, but I'm already over time. So I thank you for, the, for your attention. Thank you very much, Christophe, for this beautiful talk. Are there questions? Yes. So yes, so uh, hello. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. So um I think the, the uh, most important construction part is to construct this path measure in which the uh intersection of paths becomes very small. So could you is it possible to give us a brief sketch of how you design this path measure? Ah um Yes, yeah, so, so, so the easiest thing we can imagine is just, just draw a bunch of paths which do not intersect with each other and give the same weight for them, but that probably doesn't work. Or A bunch of paths, you mean finitely many? Yeah. So the, if you take, say, uh, 15 paths that go, for, that go out of this point, mm -hmm. the problem is that with probability one over 15, Yes, uh, yes. The, the overlap will be uh, huge. Right, right. And so, okay. so mm -hmm. it's very important so that, mm -hmm. so you're forced to have a priority measure which will have a huge support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and in some sense, it has to have a renewal uh, property that if you're unlucky and your paths uh, were the same uh, for a distance L, you still want your priority measure to, to split things uh, further as, 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 you, as you explore gamma and gamma prime, because you, you really want mm -hmm. your Laplace transform to. So from that Markovian point of view, I think the uniform measure on the directed path is, is very natural. And it's not completely intuitive that it would, that there would be something else uh, in dimension three. So let me just, Tell you maybe an, an input. It's not going to construct anything to you, but the, the 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 at least to tell you what is this word unpredictable path. And so, Benjamin Pimentel and Perez they 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 they, they were interested in the following question. So, imagine you want to build a, a path, a, a, a one-dimensional random walk. Um, uh, which will be, which will have the following feature: uh, at time k, you are allowed to to look at the all the history of your of your trajectory uh, x zero, x one, x k. Your goal is that, given this all knowledge of the, the, the trajectory up to time k, you want to be uh, such that uh, it's very hard to predict where your path will be at time k plus n. If you had a simple random walk, uh, you can 
predict with priority one over square root of n, more or less, where you will be at time k plus n. And they managed to, to, to design a priority measure on one dimensional path, which is unpredictable in the sense that the supremum of all the points to be at point x at time k plus n is of order one over n and not one over square root of n. Mm -hmm. so one over n is impossible, but one over n to the power 0 0.99 is possible. So they managed to build a priority measure on on paths that are just plus minus one increments, like the simple random walk, but which is such that it's very unpredictable to know where it will keep going later on. Mm -hmm. And using the tensor product of this path on three coordinates, or oh, sorry, on two, on two coordinates following a directed third direction, which would be deterministic, they, they can prove this theorem here. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's quite counterintuitive that it even exists. Okay, so it's hardest in three dimension, and it becomes is it does it become easier in higher dimension? And in higher dimension, it, it then it's it's uh, it's much easier because uh, because you can take mm -hmm. the uniform measure without oh, anything yes, yes. Uh, fancy on from x y. Mm -hmm. This would be enough. So okay. in that sense, dimension four, mm. the theorem here in dimension four it would be very short. You you. You prove this second moment bond using the uniform measure, using simple mm -hmm. random walks in dimension three rather than four, because you follow one direction. And in the transverse direction, you have a simple random walk in Z3. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's an easy lemma. And then you do the, the computations that I did a bit too quickly in here and there. And you have long range order for this quantity disorder on Z4. Mm -hmm. in dimension three, you need this uh, mm -hmm. black box of Benjamin Pimentel pairs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Further questions? Uh, yes, I have one. Alessandro? Yeah. Um, uh, Christophe, do you know if... Uh, so th this is, by the way, uh, I guess Tom uh, if, uh, is also very interested to this other problem. So that is the, the computation of the spin-spin correlation in, uh, in the standard uh, two-dimensional leasing model. So do you know if uh, these ideas of uh, averaging over paths with respect to a smart measure has been, ever been used to, uh, to find an alternative way of computing the asymptotics of the spin-spin correlation in, uh, in the two-dimensional easing model at the critical point? The two-dimensional easing model? Uh... Yeah, so you, you know, one possible way of, I mean, there are several uh, rigorous or formal ways of deriving the asymptotics of spin-spin. Uh, I mean, the one over distance to the one quarter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So one formal way that, uh, I, 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 that um, people in the field theory community in, uh, used, I mean, is to, so, to start writing the spin-spin as a product over uh, energies over uh, an arbitrary path from, from one spin to the other. Mm -hmm. Then you, you pass to the, um, fermionic Grasper representation, this becomes an average over an exponential of a sum over the same path of a bilinear in these uh, Grassmann variables. Mm -hmm. And then you, you try to uh, evaluate the average by expanding the exponential and, and writing an expansion and exchanging uh, mm -hmm. uh, integrals. Uh, okay, and if you do like this, you, you, you get a mess. Uh, and, uh, and, and the mess comes from the fact uh, that when you expand exponential, uh, you get this uh, the same path all over all over the the time, and when you get uh, iterated integrals along the same path, you get singularities that you have to resum. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. try to do that, uh, and okay, I, I never found a satisfactory uh, way out. And uh, this sounds very reminiscent. I, and I remember Tom once to, to telling me maybe there is a way of averaging over paths. So, so since also Tom is involved in this, I wonder whether. Uh, so may, maybe let me tell you uh, maybe a relevant comment that. Uh, um, so so it so you can you can you can easily see from uh, from. Um, from this theorem that it's it's impossible to build a measure mu in dimension two 
which would have a finite uh, Laplace transform uniformly in X and Y, in dimension two. Why? Because if you were to do that, exactly by this technology, this would imply a long range order in dimension two for such a disordered XY model and even worse, uh, like uh, Eisenberg models in dimension two. So, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, my, my is a, just an analogy, so I, I, I don't know. I guess that uh, the order, I mean, in, in the standardizing model, there is no disorder. It's just a sort of vague analogy. Uh, but uh, so, so maybe the scaling is different. I don't know or whatever. But uh, so, so may, maybe uh, an idea like that, but which would be reused every time uh, the mess starts to be uh, like by a renewal argument. Maybe this could be useful indeed. But it would not work in a one step uh, for the one over x minus y to the one force directly from x to y, because at some point this Laplace transform will start being too heavy. Whatever you, whatever mu you choose, it will right. it will explode. A anyway, just uh, if you don't know this story, I mean, a standard reference for this is this paper, this famous paper by Dotsenko and Dotsenko, where they study the. Uh, the random bond using model. They have a first part of the paper in which they 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 uh, re re recover the standard uh, one over distance to the one quarter behavior using exactly this strategy. And they okay, so, no, so that, that is a very standard reference for this story. And uh, also, it's clear yeah. from from reading that you you understand where, where where is the problem from the overlap of these paths. So okay. And uh, Tom knows uh, the story very well, actually. I, I think I learned uh, from him uh, mm -hmm. most of the story. Oh, good. I, I'll definitely have a look then. OK, so if you find something, <laughs> let, let me know. Thank you. Other questions? So since, since, Simone? since nobody uh, did ask the obvious question, so if you go away from the Nishimori line, I guess and you lose independence. Um, and um, is there any hope of we sort of to do something like and, and that the, the measure would become we sort of probably not very digestible? Is there any hope of we to, to attack this for non independent? Yes, yeah, so so variables or so so your question is a uh... Is there any hope to fill the gap uh, here? Yes. So, uh, and, and I guess I mean, somehow, I mean the, the zero question is, 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 I guess you lose the independence and, you know, right. And the, the, the more detailed question is, do you see I mean, sort of some structure in the, in, the, in the correlations which still allow you to rescue some of your arguments? Yeah, so, so, I would not have too much hope in a, in a, in a saving this argument because, as you pointed out, the the structure we use, which is this independence, and uh, this will collapse. Um, yeah. so maybe there would be some nearly independence, but it would have to be quantified with maybe some RG group or something crazy. Uh, but may maybe, if any, there could be some hope in a, in a taking for granted that on this line there is long range order, and given this statement, uh, to uh, to argue by perturbation that uh, that the system here has to be uh, close to this. Mm -hmm. So, for, for, so, in the case of the of the non abelian symmetry. Uh, this looks maybe a bit science fiction because uh, uh, <laughs> even the Gini Brin equality uh, doesn't, doesn't work. So, so mm -hmm. arguing by uh, comparisons or it looks, uh, but for example, in the case of the, for the, for the case of the quench disorder XY model that I defined at some point, maybe there uh, by using appropriate inequalities, one could travel a little bit further away from the line. There it's maybe more, uh, on the other hand, it's not non abelian signature breaking. So, okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Uh, is there any way to think about this using the uh, transfer matrix? 
Oh. <clears throat> um. <clears throat> Um, no, that's a very good, good question. I, I didn't, I mean, there is, a, there is a quenched transfer matrix here, which seems to behave well, uh, thanks to this COM. Um, I don't know if being on the Nishimori line uh, implies a nice properties on this quenched transfer matrix, but it's a, uh, it's a very good question. I, I on the spot, I, I don't have a good answer. But well, if I may just make a suggestion, to somehow if when you think of the transfer matrix, you you think about what is going on in one line and how this influences what goes on the next line, and. Uh, <clears throat> And what goes on on one line is just whether spins are up or down at each point, or for example, with the easy mode. But now you have to keep track of not only what the spin is doing at each point on the line, but <clears throat> a, a, essentially a number, which is the number of times, number of paths that got to that point. Mm -hmm. You have to keep track somehow, I can't quite phrase it correctly, mm -hmm. but somehow with the previous history, you have to not just know who got to this point, but what the train track before that looked like in some, some numerical sense. And it reminds me of this thing that uh, Temperley and I did with the, the algebra to keep track of uh, loops, that is who was connected, how many connections there were in the past. This is not exactly the same thing, but it's somehow reminiscent of that. Uh, it's, I don't know, this is maybe crazy, but it just mm -hmm. popped into my head. Uh, okay, I uh, know that, that definitively it's a good, uh, one should see what it means at uh, the level of the transfer matrix, maybe there is. Thanks for the, for the question. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, other questions? So I, I still have one. Going back to the, to the situation, could I mention, you still get a low bound for, for the two-point function. Is there any hope to get a low bound which is good enough to prove the costolitz tauless transition? Yes, so very good question too. So. So since I very much like uh, the Kosovo stylus, of course I, I, I tried a little bit. <clears throat> so, so I mean, if if you believe in a Polyakov uh, prediction, I mean uh, conjecture, or, or then uh, then uh, all the tools that we use here, they don't even see that the symmetry is abelian or not. They just use mm. so. So, so the, 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 low, the only lower bound this can give will be something really bad in dimension two because it should match with, uh, with what Polyakov would give in the non abelian case and, and quench disorder in any case should make correlations even smaller. So, so lower bound should be small, but, but, <clears throat> but nevertheless, I, 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 I tried to, to do something with the XY model and the, uh, and, uh, and using the fact that the symmetry is abelian, uh, one can do some things averaging on paths that we could not do when the thing is non-abelian, kind of embedding trees instead of paths or things like that. And it, it, it looks uh, not impossible to me that one could prove a kind of BKT transition uh, by, by generalizing a little bit the setup here. But, uh, but uh, if there were no vortices, I see how to do. But on the other hand, if there were no vortices, it's basically like reconstructing the GFF. So that's not a surprise, but vortices are, are, are an issue he, he, he here in some sense. So if you want, you could try to do the uh, Bayesian statistics problem that you have cameras in dimension two that have an angle 
and you are given the respective uh, uh, orientations of cameras in 2D, and you want to recover the initial field, if you were told by someone that, uh, okay, the data is corrupted, but also there are few vortices, then yes, you can do something. But uh, if you don't know anything about the vortices, uh, uh, and if this information is, uh, so, yeah, so, so yeah, vortices are a bit of an issue, as usual. <laughs> okay, so thanks a lot, uh, that's uh, illuminating. Other questions? I have one. If someone yes. has any clue or comments to do for the quantum <laughs> in systems, uh, I mean, in the sense of designing a appropriate Nishimori disorder in this setting, this would be uh, um, this this would be interesting. The more I think about it, the less. Uh, so I still have some hope, but the fact you have to trace the exponential uh, minus beta Hamiltonian, uh, if you want to try to cancel out as we do in the proof, the numerator and the denominator with those traces, it imposes a lot of constraints on the disorder you may want to, to, to look at. But still, maybe there is... Uh... Yes, so the objective is the quantum Heisenberg for a magnet so with a small disorder. Uh... I mean, uh, there would still be this issue that uh, Simon uh, mentioned that even if something was doable for a uh, ferromagnet quantum Heisenberg model on the on its Nishimori line, whatever it is, still you would need to close the gap. But already this would be something very near the, the, the true, yeah. uh, so it would be very good. Yeah, so good questions for the audience to answer. Another question from the audience? No, so let us thank Christophe very much for, for this talk.